Amen. Take your Bibles. You see it up there on the screen. Um, this is going to conclude my series on the mind and all things pertaining to that. Now i got to go to work and come up with a new sermon. Something different for next Sunday. Uh, and I, I, actually, I thought I was done last Sunday, and I got to looking at, at my notes. And uh, in fitting with today, in the spirit of what we're doing today, uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to end it this way. Last, last week, we talked about, in the name of the sermon, uh, which we can finally upload to YouTube now, um, was called A Messed Up Mind or a Made Up Mind. Two types of people in this world that um, uh, John was right in, in the things that he said. There's an old saying that I'd learned years ago uh, when Lisa and I first started thinking about what to do with our children as far as education is concerned. And uh, it just really stuck in me. And it, it, it's hundreds of years old. But it goes something like this. As the twig is bent, the tree is inclined. And it showed a, like a little boy going through the woods. It was a little picture drawn. A little boy going through the woods. And he found this sapling in the woods. And he just, you know how boys do when they go through the woods. Just take and he bent it. Well, that sapling eventually became a tree. But for the life of that tree, that tree was inclined in the direction that that boy bent that sapling. And that goes to the idea of not just birthing children into this world, but raising children in this world and raising them to live in this world in a right manner, a moral manner, a respectful manner, a hard-working manner. These are the things that built our country. Are, am, am I telling the truth this morning? It wasn't laziness and it wasn't government programs that built America to its greatness. It was the people, the average people, who were raised in a home, they were taught right things. They were, they were inclined in a certain way. And that was the greatness of our nation. And so um, that goes to the sermon last week. You're either going to have a messed up mind or you're going to have a made up mind. And uh, hopefully the children, and it's my prayer always, that the children of this church, those who are sitting here right now, uh, when they reach that age where they step out into the world and they have to decide after sampling what's in this world, we know they're going to stumble, we know they're going to fall at times, but after finding out what this world is like, saying, I don't want this. Can I hear some old people say amen? amen. I don't want this world the way it is. I want nothing to do with it. I want out. I want God's way. And uh, so this morning... We're going to talk about the new mind, the mark of someone who is truly born again. I was mentioned uh, this morning that I, I like the word religion. I'm not afraid of it. I don't back down from the idea that I am a religious person. I believe in a religion. I have a religion. I am a um, religious clergyman, I guess you could call it. Uh, and it's my life. Uh, it's my occupation, it's what pays the bills, and it's what I do. But aside from that, religion does not get you into good standing with God. We're all sinners, we've all violated God's law, we've broken His commandments. If we were to all stand up here, all of us adults, and stand here and tell these kids things we've done, the kids would go, I ah, don't want to grow up! And who would blame them, Amen. But uh, once, once the Holy Ghost of God transforms your life, God is the one who changes your mind. God is the one who changes your heart. God is the one who gives you the new mind. I remember there was a, a young lady that got saved at, when we were pastoring out of Richwoods years ago. Uh, her and her husband started coming to church, a young couple. And... Uh, all of a sudden, man, she got her heart right with God and she got saved. And about two or three months after she got saved, I opened it up for testimony and she stood up 
She told that little church down there, she said, you know, I used to be a liberal. She said, I used to be like, oh, I'm going to vote for Bill Clinton, and I'm, I'm pro-abortion, and I'm pro this, and I'm pro that, and all this stuff that all the left stands for. And she said, you know what? I got saved. I started reading the Bible. All of a sudden, I changed my mind on those things. I didn't do that as her preacher. I didn't tell her she had to believe a certain way in order to belong to our church. God is the one who changed her mind about positions that she had taken as a probably a young college student. And now all of a sudden she sees the world in a different light. And that's what it is to have a new mind. In Mark chapter 12 verse 30, the Bible says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. We know this by heart. With all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy what? What does it say there? Our mind and with all thy strength this is the first commandment and so I'm just asking you the question this morning I can't be your judge I wouldn't want to be your judge I wouldn't want you to be my judge but I'm gonna ask you this morning is that where your mind is is your mind stayed on the Lord and you love him you don't just give him a verbal witness you love the Lord and you love Him with both sides of your brain, the front and the back and everything, all the gray stuff in between. You love Him with every thought that you have. This is the commandments of the new covenant. And there's only two. It's love the Lord your God with all your mind and all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Those are not hard to do once God changes you. Somebody say amen. Uh, let's pray. Father, I ask your blessings now upon your word this morning. And bless these people as they hear it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. In Acts chapter 17, we read about the... In fact, turn there because there's a little bit of, of missing here. I was kind of... I, I remember putting these notes together in a hurry because I was getting excited about it. And I didn't put in the context of Acts chapter 17. It says these were more noble. Well, who was it? Well, the verse prior to that will tell you. In Acts chapter 17, the, I mean, the apostles are preaching the gospel everywhere. They're going here, there. They're going to, uh, they've been to uh, Athens. What they found in Athens was that the Athenian people were always looking for some new thing to come into town. They worshipped multiple gods and there was always somebody new coming in with some new religious idea. And when he would come on it, people would jump on that. And that was what the Bible refers to as the Athenians. They were always about some new thing. But the scripture testifies of those who lived in Berea. And there's a lot of churches named Berean, Berean Baptist Church, Berean Pentecostal Church. A lot of churches named after them because of what the Scripture testifies of them. In verse 10, the brethren immediately sent away Paul and, and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now, I want to tell you something. When you change a Jew's heart, you've done something, amen. I'm not knocking the Jews, but they are stubborn, mule-headed, Everything else in the world. That's why God loves them, by the way. Okay, he's going to save them one of these days. So they went to the Bereans. And the Bible says, the verse says, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. That means that when Sunday came around, you didn't have to ask them, Are you going to church today? They'd already decided, we're getting up, we're going to church. You know why? I want to hear the Word of God. I want to hear the preacher. I want to hear that preacher give me Bible verses to think about and things to learn. That's what I want. They received the Word with all readiness of mind and searched the Scriptures. How often? Daily. Whether those things were so. With the advent, you know where, where I'm going with this, with the advent of social media in this world, Doctrines and false doctrines and false teachings and false prophets, they are everywhere. And they're crazy. But because of the advent of social media, people, thousands, millions of people are believing their garbage, believing their nonsense. And only the Word of God can correct it. Only the Word of God can correct it. But what people want is a fast thing, a fast hit off Facebook. And then they want to scroll on. Nobody wants to stop and even ask, is this biblical? I, I, I'm going to stop for a minute and give you an example. It's just a pet peeve of mine. 
This is when I really started figuring out that I, I don't like social media that much. This is when I started seeing people on Facebook say, I've sent this to you because I love Jesus. And if you love Jesus, you will send this to ten of your friends to show that you love Jesus. I never sent it to anybody. My love for Jesus is not measured by me sending a, a meme to all my friends. My love for Jesus is displayed in the things that I do outside of Facebook. That, like we were talking about Cali, the things that people don't always see. Somebody say amen. Ephesians 4. Turn there. And this is really the heart of it. Uh, make sure everything's okay. But you have not learned so Christ. Ephesians 4.20. If so be that you have heard him, I'm assuming everybody in this room has heard about Jesus Christ and have been taught by him. If you hear more than once, then you've been taught by Jesus Christ through the Bible, not through me, but through the Bible. As the truth is in Jesus. Now I'll ask you a question. Would Jesus ever lie? Did Jesus ever lie? Jesus is God. Jesus is the Word of God. And I want to ask you a question. Is there any lie in this book right here? There can't be. So if this book says that this thing that people do is wrong and a sin in God's eyes, what does that mean? Does that mean that we can still do it? No, it means it's a sin in God's eyes. If God said, this is what I want you to do, is if we don't do it, is that a sin? It's called a sin of omission. Instead of a sin of commission. It's still a sin. If God says it, it's true. Doesn't matter how many people in the world believe it. God said it and it's true. That's what that means. You have heard of him. You've been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. That you put off concerning... This is that young lady I was telling you about. She, or God, began to put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. The old man is what this flesh does, and has done, and may do again. And I hate it. That's what this old man is. And Tuesday I'll be older. I'll be the older man. Which is corrupt, according to the deceitful lusts. Yes, your pastor lusts. You don't get too many preachers admit that, do you? Listen, I'm normal just like you are. Ha, ha, ha. So I just said you lust too. Your flesh is just as corrupt as mine is, and mine is just as corrupt as yours is, and I don't try... Well, how can I say this and say it right? I won't say I won't try to please God in the flesh because I try to do right every day. But I fail. So I will say that there is another part to me. It's the inner man, the new man. And that's what he's saying in that very next verse. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That means it is a new way of thinking. That means if God says that life begins at conception, and He does, if God said that a child is alive in the womb of its mother, it is. That means if you were pro-abortion before you got saved, you let a little bit of the Holy Ghost get in you, and a little bit of the Word of God get in you, and all of a sudden you're going, you know what, that's murder. That's wicked! To do that. See, it changes your mind. You don't, I don't change your mind. I can't. I tried. As a young pastor, I thought it was my job to coerce everybody and change everybody's mind into my way of thinking. And God said, Mike, I'll pull you out of this church, rip you, I'll tear you right out of this place. I thought it was my job, but it's not. It, only God can do that. 
Because if I can change your mind on something, somebody else can come and change it back to something else. But if God changes your mind on something, it's changed forever. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man, which is after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And it's, it has to do with your mind and how you think. 2 Timothy 1, 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Now that doesn't mean that, oh, it's a sin. I've had people say, it's a, it, it, it's a sin to be afraid, isn't it? No. If it was, I'm in bad shape. It's not a sin to be afraid. It's not a sin to have fear. The Bible is just telling you that that didn't come from God. The devil will make you afraid of all kinds of things. In fact, I've found out the devil will make you afraid of things that ain't even there. And never were. God has not given us the spirit of fear. He has given us a, a spirit of power. That's how you read that. But of power. A spirit of power. That means we have abilities that we did not have prior to being saved. And a, a spirit of love. That means we have the ability to love people that before we got saved, we hated them and wished them dead. And that's what hate really is when you get down to it. That's what the, the book of James says. If a man hates his brother, he's a murderer. You just, you just already killed. You want him dead. And when God... I know people make us mad. I know we are bitter against people. I know people do uh, hideous things to us. And they, we, they have committed sins against us. And, and it causes us to want to hate them. And causes us to want bad things to happen to them. But if you get right down to it, ask yourself what I asked this morning in Sunday school. Would you want for eternity for you in heaven to be able to see them in the lake of fire burning for all of eternity? And if you could understand the true nature of hell and how awful it is, you would never say that about anybody. I don't care how bad you hated them. And see that change, the ability to love people that you didn't love before only comes from God. Man can't give it to you. You can't give it to yourself. Spirit of love and of a sound mind. That means you're not losing it when everybody else is. The Bible is telling us that in the last days there is going to be a falling away. And I believe literally it is going to happen. And who is going to be left standing? Who's going to, who's going to have the strong knees capable of standing in the evil day. That's exactly what Paul said in Ephesians 6. To be able to stand in the evil day. And when the evil day comes, will you be able to stand in the power of your own flesh? No, absolutely not. And you can't change your mind to get there. In fact, some people, some people just don't like to hear about Bible prophecy because they say it scares them. Uh, when I read this Bible and see the things that are coming, yeah, I'm scared. But if I'm right with, if my heart, and I'm, if I'm right with God, if I'm saved and born again, I, my knees will not tremble on that day. And it won't be me that does it. It won't be me that does it. That's the point. Philippians 4, 6. Turn there in your Bible. Turn to Philippians. If I'm right, uh, Ephesians, Philippians is, what number book is that in the New Testament? If, I'm, if I remember right, I'm trying to remember my King James Code notes. Is it number eight? Matthew's 40. Matthew's the 40th book of the Bible. Oh, well, it doesn't matter, but... Huh? F Philippians is? What well, was I off? Anyway, in verse 8, there are eight things here. And we're going to read them in a minute. What is the, why am I making a big deal about the number 8? The number 8 represents a new beginning. Seven days in a week, and the week is over with. But then the eighth day comes, and that's the week starting all over again okay um, children Jewish children are circumcised on what day the eighth day 
Now, there is a, there is a biological reason for that. Doctors have figured that out. But it represents a renewal. They're no longer part of this world. They are part of God's kingdom. That's why he does it on the eighth day. And there's all kinds of eights in the Bible, and I won't get into all that. But this has to do with a renewing of your mind. Starting all over again. When I began to study the Bible as a prof prophecy book, that's what I did. I started all over again. I, I wiped out everything that I'd learned before. And I said, God, you put it back in the way you want it. And so Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing. And God was preaching this to me 4 o'clock this morning. I guarantee you, God was preaching this to me 4 o'clock this morning. I won't tell you why. It had to do with something that happened. And I got up. And I just, God just said, Mike, go over your notes for, for this morning. And I was reading this. Be careful for nothing. Now, that doesn't mean get in the car and drive like an idiot. What it means is don't sit and worry and freak out over anything. Not just small stuff. He said be careful for nothing. I don't care if you're going to the electric chair. They don't have electric chair anymore. I don't care if you're going to the needle. And you're in prison, and there's saved people who are on death row. God said, don't worry about it. Because even though man's justice has to be accomplished, my justice has declared you righteous. And when they slip that needle in you, you're going to pay man's debt. But your debt with me has already been paid by Jesus Christ. So when they slip that needle in you, you're coming home. Boy, we don't like to hear that as conservatives, do we? Ah, kill them all, I say, right? But God even says that to a man on death row. Paul, Paul had that in his mind when he's in prison because he knows they're going to take him and they're going to kill him. He knows it. And he says, be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, that su supplication means asking God, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And so I, I was, God, I'm going to pray now. And I prayed. And I asked God specific questions. And verse 7 says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, I cannot explain to you how you can have peace. I can tell you who can give it to you shall keep your hearts and, and what? Minds through Christ Jesus. See, it's a spiritual issue. It's not physical. The Spirit of God is what gives you the peace that you know that things, listen to me, that as long as God is the one who does it, it'll be okay. That's when you know you trust God. Is when you decide it doesn't matter to me how I think it might turn out if it goes what I think is the wrong way. If God does this, it'll be all right. That's when you know you trust God. So he said, they shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So finally, brethren, people like to hear preachers say that. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, that's five. Whatsoever things are of good report, what, if there be any virtue, that's seven. If there be any praise, that's eight. Think on these things. A new mind. Versus, if you just take the opposite of those things. Finally, brethren, what, whatsoever things are a lie. And sometimes we focus on lies. What, whatsoever things are honest. We focus on dishonesty. Especially when it's somebody else. Or... Maybe you were dishonest and you're worried about getting caught. Give it to God. Give it to God. Amen. Whatsoever things are just, we worry about who's getting away with something. Oh, they're getting away with that. I don't think that. I don't think that's right. They're getting away with all these people up in St. Louis. Kim Gardner's their district attorney. She's not prosecuting murderers and thieves. And every guy shot a. What, how old was that girl? Eleven years old. Shot an eleven-year-old girl up there. They refused to send a prosecutor to the trial. 
and the judge had to dismiss the charges against that man. That's wicked. What makes me mad? Burns me up. Don't focus on that. Focus on things that are just and right. Whatsoever things are pure. That means quit looking at stuff on the internet. That's the old man. The new man's telling you, don't look at that. Don't watch that. Don't read that. Don't laugh at that joke. That's what the new man's telling you. Amen? Am I right? One guy says I'm right. Whatsoever things are lovely. Whatsoever things are of good report. I, I did. That's why I quit watching the news. I got tired of it. I got tired of being depressed every time I watched the news. Depressed and scared, Ron. I was, I was scared out of my mind watching the news. Watching what I thought was happening. It was all a lie. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. You have to ask God or just yield to God and God will do it. But God will renew your mind to where you just don't think about those things anymore. And thinking think or stop thinking things is a lot harder than stop doing things. How about an amen to that? Philippians 2, 3, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Lowliness of mind. That's a new mind. That's what God gives you. A lowliness of mind. That's what the joke was on Callie. Boy, she likes to be up here at the center of everybody's attention. Everybody looking at her. You ought to see her when I ask her to sing. But she would do it. Because she, she knew I asked her to. And um, to, have, to have that automatically is good to start out with. To keep it. That's another thing. Amen. Let this, uh, look not every man to his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Now, that does not mean be a busybody. The Bible expressly teaches against you being a busybody in everybody else's business. What that means is that if somebody is struggling or suffering or hurting, that you, as a brother or sister in Christ, care about them. Pray for them. Help them out if they need some kind of help. You do it. Amen. Uh... Let this mind be in you, which is also Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, it's because He was God. Amen. He is God. He is equal with God the Father. He said, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The name of Jesus given to us in Isaiah chapter 9 is wonderful. Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now, I don't understand that, but I believe it. So he is God, but when he comes down here on earth, he's already proving that he's not acting superior to everybody else. And God is no stuck up in the air. I'm God and you guys are sinners and I'll have nothing to do with you. He sat and broke bread with them, amen. He would come to your house and you watching R-rated movies on TV and... Playboys under your mattress. Jesus would come to your house while you were smoking and drinking and sit down next to you and say, let's thank God for this meal. He would come to your house. You know, you know how I know? He said, I stand at the door and knock. Am I right? Made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. First Peter 1.13 Gird up the loins of your mind. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to explain that one too much. Tighten the belt. Pull your pants up. Come on. Pull your pants up. I'm still against that. Don't wear your pants sagging down to your kneecaps. Amen. Gird up the loins. Amen. I mean, look through the Bible. All these stories where it said, and Joshua rose up early and girded up his loins. And you can't go into battle with your loins ungirded. Amen. 
But here's what that means. He says it right next to it. Be sober. Be sober. Quit drinking. Quit doing the drugs. Be sober. Be sober spiritually. Quit following drunk spirits, evil spirits, false spirits. And hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So a new mind is going to be a sober mind. Titus 2.6, young men likewise exhort to be, and I would say this, J.R. Callie, all you young kids, all my grandkids, listen to me, all you girls back there, back there on the back row, all you kids in this church, listen to me. My exhortation to you, which means that my, my word to you, my, my wish for you, my hope for you, is that no child in this church turns themselves over to drugs and alcohol. And you say amen to that. Every one of you say amen to that. If I could, I would have every adult stand up and testify to you children what it will do to you. Not what it might do. Oh, you, you might do this and you might do that. No, it will do it. And a lot of people in this church know it. Busted up vehicles, busted up houses, busted up marriages, busted up families, busted up jobs, you keep losing jobs over it. Am I telling the truth? But see, by the time most kids are 12 to 13 years old, they have already been introduced to it. It was that way when I was in junior high. By the time I was 12, I was hanging around one of the kids in the neighborhood whose parents grew pot in their basement. That's who I was hanging around. And my mama didn't like it. And she told me, I don't want you hanging around him no more. I didn't listen. But she was right. She was dead right. So by the time most kids are 12, 13 years old, they've already been introduced to it. Either through some kid at school or get this one. Their own home. Either they have access to their mom and daddy's stash. Or their mom and daddy does it and they don't want to feel guilty in front of the kid. Don't you? I don't want to see you doing this now. <laughs> then why are you doing it, dad? I don't want to. I just don't want to. Don't back talk me. And the truth of it is, now parents are giving their kids drugs and alcohol at a young age. Because they think that by doing that, they're going to teach them to do it responsibly. Nobody, nobody does it responsibly. It is irresponsible to do it to begin with. Amen. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. And I'm telling you, you'll weather every storm. You'll get through every fight. You will make it through the worst things that could happen to a person in life. If you'll trust in the Lord. And have your mind stayed on God. And the only way to do that is let God do it. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates and be ready to every good work. That means obey the law. You have a mind now that wants to obey the law instead of disobey it. Hebrews 8.10, I'm almost done. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. God is speaking of a day. Watch this now. He's speaking of a day when we no longer will walk around with a Bible in our hand or in our lap or reading it off our phone. We will have it in our hearts. We will know it every word by heart. I've heard of people 
who had an ability to, they, people would say they've memorized major portions of the Bible or large parts of the Bible or most of the Bible. I don't know if I've ever heard of anybody who, who would say I've memorized the entire Bible word for word. I don't know of anybody like that. But I will tell you that there is coming a day when God is going to transform all of His people and there will be no King James Bibles anywhere except in our hearts. We will have them and we will know them and we will live by them in perfection. It's called the resurrection. Amen. The resurrection. I preached yesterday out of my grandma's Bible. You know why I preached out of my grandma's Bible? She don't need it no more. Amen. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. This is the last verse right here, and it's my exhortation to you to... Here we go now. You might want to write this down. This is very... This is good stuff. This is the best stuff I've ever come up with. Are you ready? Think Bible. I came up with that, Jerry. I, I, all on my own. You know how the guy came up with Think Mink? I said, Think Bible. And what I mean by that is in every situation in life, Every situation. You seek out either in your mind or in the book or on your, you got, if you got it on your phone. You say, you know, before I make a decision, I want to go talk to God. You praying as you talking to God. You reading the Bible is God talking to you. And you say, you know what? I know this sounds funny. But I'm just, I'm reading my Bible. I got double witnesses all over the place. I just know that this is wrong for me. And I'm just not, in, what, in whatever issue of life it is, you, God puts it in you. That's what he said. That's what he said back here. I will put my laws into their mind. I'll do it. So you don't have to, mem you don't have to do the hard work, Gary. You don't have to memorize it. Yeah, sit and read it forever and ever and ever. Oh, I, oh, I, I forget part of Psalm 23. I do. I for, always forget part of Psalm 23. I don't know why. Okay? Because in my mind, maybe it's messed up. But one of these days, I'm not going to forget any of it. It's going to happen. But in the new man, it should happen. It should be happening now. It should be happening already. You should already see a change and how you see this world and how you think about things. And if you see that change in you, nurture that. That's God working in you. Let Him build on that. Let Him water that. Let Him, let him till that ground up. Amen. Let Him do those things in you that He wants to do in you. And you'll know. You'll always know that you're born again. You'll always know. Let's stand to our feet. I'm running a little over, and that's because Callie took too long to get up here and get her diploma. She slowed me down. You come by after we say amen. You come by and congratulate her. Would you do that? Okay. Lord bless you this morning. And I want you to think about what I preach. Think about what the Word of God said. In, in the things that I say, I'm always careful to tell you, you don't have to listen to me. But when I'm reading Scripture, you better listen to it. You better listen to it. And let God work it in you. Heavenly Father, I come before you today. And God, I thank you, Father, for making me the first congregant of today's message. I had to... I had to have it preached to me first before you would let me preach it to anybody else and I love you for that I'm glad father that you do it that way because I don't I don't ever want to be the biggest hypocrite of this whole church I never want to be that and so God
in as much as there are errors in my mind and things that are not right, God, would you correct them gently with your Holy Spirit. Show me the way to walk. Show me the way to go. Show me the, the wise decisions to make. Show me how to be like Jesus Christ and how he lived and how he walked and how he did things and how he treated people because that is the right way to be. And now, Lord, that's how I want to be. And, and Father, if, if that be in anybody's mind here, that they truly do want to live and walk the way Jesus did, then, Lord, that would seem to me to be a good sign that they are truly right with you. And Father, would you build on that? Would you feed that? Would you water that? Would you nurture that? Lord, would you plow up the fallow ground in their lives, in areas of their life, Father, Lord, that are hardened against you and hardened against your word? Would you break through the clods of dirt so that the seed of the word of God can take root and grow and bring forth fruit and manifest it out of their life, which makes you happy, it pleases you to see a fruitful vine Father, may this church continue to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit of God in the things that we do and say and how we live both here in front of everybody and how we live outside of this place. Bless us now. Forgive us of our sins. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Come back 3 o'clock. I'll be here.